We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search, match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. From your favorite source for Chicago White Sox talk, delivering news, interviews, analysis, and more. This is the Sox Machine Podcast with your hosts, Jim Margulis, James Fegan, and Josh Nelson. Thanks, Rob, and welcome to the Sox Machine Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Nelson, and it's Wednesday night, April 3rd, 2024. Awful wet weather arrived in Chicago this week and made a mess of the area. The White Sox and Braves' third game was completely wiped out, and perhaps mercifully, game one ended after eight innings with the Braves winning nine to nothing. But the White Sox are finally on the board with their first victory of 2024, beating the mighty Braves three to two on Tuesday night, thanks to another outstanding start by Garrett Crochet. We'll talk about Crochet, White Sox bringing back starting pitcher Mike Clevenger, and preview this weekend's series as the White Sox head out on the road for the first time in 2024 to Kansas City. And thanks to Sox Machine Patreon supporters, we are able to send James Fegan along with them. Speaking of James Fegan, he and the managing editor of SoxMachine.com, Jim Margulis, join me now. Hello, James and Jim. And Jim, I'll start with you first. Like I told you months ago, I've always believed that Garrett Crochet would be a dominant <laughs> starter. There is nothing to worry about. Lies. He would totally regain Liar. his velocity and develop two other plus pitches. Okay, I'm being cheeky. But, Jim, is Garrett Crochet suddenly 2014 Chris Sale now? I thought he was going to be 2021 Carlos Herdon. Like, how many uh, lefties are we uh, comparing him to here? We're upgrading him. Yeah. With every start, he's just getting upgraded. <laughs> no, I'm still comfortable with the 2021 Rodon, just in terms of like the whole, he's never done this for any measurable stretch of a career. So let's not get ahead of ourselves when it comes to like the six month project aspect, but in terms of like per start uh, dominance, like per batter uh, effectiveness, I think he's up there so far. I think it's probably fair to say. The reason I bring up 2014, Jim, because that season, Chris Dale was awesome. He was 12 and four and 26 starts with a 2.17 ERA. And for the life of the Chicago White Sox, they could never score for the guy. <laughs> I feel like that's going to be Garrett Crochet's 2024 season, James. I mean, two starts. He's been fantastic. And we'll talk about the White Sox offense later on. But total run support after two starts is three runs for Garrett Crochet. So he's had to be uh, as pinpoint and excellent as he has been in the first two starts of 2024. But I want to talk about the article that you wrote on SoxMachine.com, James. And the journey for Garrett Crochet finding the cut fastball. We, We talked about this at spring training. And he threw it in the backfields, warming up before spring training games. The pitch wasn't very good, but my Lord, against Atlanta, like the Braves hitters had a terrible time picking up his fastball. And when they were looking on the inside corner, Crochet was just able to throw this low 90s cut fastball over the outside corner to steal strikes. And it really seems like we could maybe wait on the changeup that if he needs a third pitch, he's a four-seam slider Cutter type of pitcher right now. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the easy uh, cop here, uh, you know, is, is Billy Pierce. You know, going deeper in the uh, history of White Sox lefties, <laughs> sure, Garrett was listed like eight inches taller, and uh, you know, probably throws ten to fifteen miles an hour harder. But I think it's probably a similar, you know, similar ownership of the inside of the plate. I would imagine. Um, yeah, as the cutter is an interesting thing because um, the one the way it was developed, as he kind of explained to me the other day, was that he was trying. You know, his, his breaking ball is very slurvy and curvy or kind of sweeper like, and he was trying to get it harder. And it as his, his description is that the shape went to shit. And so he kind of had to abandon it. And, you know, he, he just said, like, let me just not mess with my slider too much. And the way they kind of found the cutter is like, well, you're kind of unintentionally cutting your fastball all the time what if you just kind of tweak your hand a little bit position uh when you're cutting it and that will kind of intentionally come out he still doesn't have like a great controller will of like when the the uh four seam like uh rides or cuts which is really kind of defining effectively wild right now where like he can't necessarily predict the movement really great but he's firing in the zone and like either one is um, kind of a happy accident. He's either riding at the top of the zone where it kind of plays wherever, or he's when he's cutting it, he's like really getting inside to right handers, which is like already his chief goal. And you know, something Garrett will say, and even talking to Soroka today, was, uh, he, he mentioned something similar. Soroka pointed out he had his four seam is so good. He had a strikeout of Austin Riley la- the other night, um, where Riley is like, timed up for the cutter is probably like one of his more mid nineties cutters, but just flat out swings over it. Cause everything he's doing is just trying to cheat to like hit that forcing at the top of letters and everything was geared to that. So like, it wasn't like he was super fooled. Um, but <laughs> he's just when these, when your two pitches are so good, just something that's distinct from them is, is useful. And Garrett said outright, like the pitch characteristics on this actual, put it in a vacuum like the cutter is not like it's very pedestrian it's not bad uh but it's not you know especially great pitch it's not like you know corbin burns his cutter it's just it's something that's just noticeably distinct from his slider and fastball to where if you are gearing up for either one of those pitches and you get the cutter you're not ready you're not equipped to hit it um so that's really all he needed from a third pitch which is very rodon like where it's just like the fastball and slider are what's carrying you. The changeup is literally just to show it or, you know, because you're using it so rarely um, still, and because it's not something you really have to account for in the same way, like when you throw it, no one's going to be ready for it because that's not the pitch they're preparing for. Well, with Rodon too, like he could throw like a, like high 80s slider and you could throw like a low 80s slider. So it was basically like two pitches. It seems like, uh, based on your earlier reporting in spring, like crochet was trying to find two sliders uh, to you know, have one that could you know have more of a sharper, uh, you know, firmer line to the plate and one that was more of a sweeper. And then he just couldn't quite find that high 80 slider. So the modification on the fastball is what served that purpose. Right. Like he was thinking that he was going to still keep it loopy and have like a curveball that he basically threw, which is what his slider has turned to at times and find a harder slider. But and then, I don't know what he came up with that was like unacceptable to go forward with, but um, this, this seems like a better balance for him and something that he can actually, you know, call to on command, uh, which makes it kind of just kind of a, Oh, interesting story that he'd show me his Vulcan change up grip that he's also working on, which it'd be nice if that worked one day, but it's not something that has like a lot of pressure on it, which is what the change up has been for him and for Rodon and Kopech where it's this pitch. They're just not really suited to the throw that they're constantly getting like, you got to get feel for a change up somehow, which like, this is not how I operate. I'm a, I'm a grip and rip type of guy. Yeah. That's watching a lot of college baseball, especially the top college pitchers of this upcoming draft class to that point, James, I feel like so many of them are forcing themselves to try to throw a change up and the pitches aren't very good, and opposing teams are picking up on this, and they're just crushing them. <laughs> so I wonder when they get drafted, like Hagen Smith, Chase Burns, these guys don't have great changeups. I, I wonder if this might be a new trend in Major League Baseball. If you can't throw a changeup, let's try to throw two different type of breaking pitches or variants of your slider uh, to just to show a, a different look. One question I have when it comes to crochet, and I've got the stat cast data in front of me from the start against Atlanta. Has Ethan Katz or Brian Bannister or maybe Crochet himself explained 
his spin rate with his four seam fastball because this is what jumps out on me on on the page. He generates as much spin with the four seam fastball as he does with the slider, James. Uh, no, we haven't talked about that great other than just like he's got freakishly huge hands and um he gets good extension and uh like, like there's all sorts of characteristics that kind of help his fastball um that rossman kind of seems like alongside of it but isn't necessarily what people harp on is like it, it seems like it's more of a byproduct of everything he's doing than like it, it carries everything um he doesn't seem like he has like that elite 3000 RPM spin like ability to spin the ball. It kind of is a little inconsistent on him, but you know, he, he throws hard from the left side. So uh, the, the sweepy motion is, is, is effective. Jim, the thing I am going to continue to pay attention to, to crochet in these early starts, his ability to maintain his velocity. And so far, I mean, Pedro Grafal pushed crochet to seven innings. He threw seven in innings against the Braves. It's two starts. It's 13 total innings. And everything that I'm seeing on StatCast, yeah, there's a bit of a velocity dip. But, I mean, he's starting out 98, 99, and he's still at 96, 97 when he gets deeper into starts. So, at least on the velocity side, he's able to maintain deeper as he gets deeper into the start. And, obviously, that's a good sign, something we're going to be paying attention to in future starts. But is there anything else – as far as endurance wise, when you're watching crochet after two starts that has impressed you or something you make note of, and you're going to be paying attention to in his next start against Kansas city. No, I think like when it comes to like how he looked, I think it's more or less ideal. I think the cutter is a pitch. I understood a lot better the second start versus the first start when it looked like just mistake fastball. That was maybe just a little bit slower than the fastball they were expecting. And so they fouled it off or just happened to miss it and they were on time and just you know, the, the barrel wasn't where it was supposed to be. But it didn't look like a pitch that he was going to feature prominently because the fastball and slider were effective. And then he finally got some swings and misses or swings and broken bats where like the location was great and the purpose was well-timed and like, oh, that's why that pitch is there. That's why he's working on it. It's not just a third pitch for third pitch's sake. So... That crossed that, uh, or that checked that box for me for now. I think there might have been like a little bit of vulnerability uh, third time through later in the start because they started ripping him like the last couple innings he pitched. Like he gave up the solo shot to Azuna, but gave up a warning track fly ball, a, a well, you know, like a, a ripped one hopper to the second baseman. So the contact was getting louder. That's something to watch for like when the weather warms up and the ball starts carrying to all fields versus just left field uh, on Tuesday. Um, but really, I think my biggest concern or what I'm watching for with Crochet is one, like, will he actually have a tough inning? Will he actually have like a 30 pitch inning? And if so, how does he rebound from that so far? Like his innings have been pretty easy and that's why Griffol's been able to push him. And then like, if that's really like a thing that doesn't happen too often because like he's pounding the strike zone and really not getting into any deep counts, uh, because like he's just ahead all the time and like his swing and miss stuff is good enough or it gets put into play weekly, which I think is another skill. And I think, you know, they, they really haven't stretched out at bats on him to where he's facing seven pitches to one guy and eight pitches to another. He's doing that uh, reasonably well so far. So I think, you know, unless, you know, he hits a snag and the starts start getting tougher, what he looks like right now is what I think you hope he looks like going forward. And as long as that's the case, my concern is more about like, just yeah, how does his five day routine hold up? And, you know, will there be a case of him having dead arm or will there be a case of him just not having it because like he's a little bit off? Cause as we saw with Rodon, as we saw with Carson Fulmer, with guys who were brought up to the rotation on either a fast track or a very irregular uh, matriculation, you know, they just couldn't quite handle like the second month or the third month or, you know, just it started building up on them and kind of got away from them. And so when with crochet, given that he hasn't had that traditional just 20 start, 25 start, 100 plus inning season, uh, you know, I think that's really my biggest concern is like, does he actually know what he's doing or do the White Sox have a better idea of how to teach that skill at the major league level versus like speed running them through the minors and hoping they figure it out. 
So James, moving forward, when it comes to crochet, it's very early. But what are the White Sox more concerned about moving forward? His pitch count or innings total? Um, hmm. I mean, I think innings long term, pitch count is something you kind of just monitor how he looks. Uh, which was interesting because like Grafol acknowledged last night that his velocity dropped like midway through the start. He kind of um sold it in terms of like it was nice to see him like pitching and mixing and not just blowing guys away which is like yes it was but you'd like to not yield the ability while while shifting to that mode um obviously there's there's not the track record where it's you know crochet said he felt good and you know he just doesn't have the starting history where it can be like that it's really unusual to fade velocity because that's something that definitely happens to young pitchers. We certainly see it in college uh, for guys who maybe have a similar level of starter reps in their life that Crochet is at this point. And something that Crochet said, like, he was pumped to get in the seventh because he doesn't think he's done it since, like, his sophomore year of college, and he thinks he's done it, like, three years in his life. So um, <laughs> he really just has, like, no track record, and he really touted that, like, it's not the pitch count for him, it's the up-downs that he really just is not used to that he hasn't done in, like, an incredible amount of years. Um, so I think both merit watching, but I think, you know, the innings that add up is where you're going to see like the decision of like, let's get him off maybe the five day schedule down the road, or let's, you know, skip him a turn or, you know, theoretically in some wild word where they have a, a surplus of options because they have Clevenger and Nestrini or Brad Keller and all these like kind of options maybe percolating, or maybe even Jonathan Cannon has a really good start to the year or something like that, uh, where he's an option in the second half where you can skip him or, um, you know, extend him out to a, a six man rotation and give him some options because I don't think that they want to like burn past 130, 150 with like top velocity or anything. Uh, even in the, it's hard to say how they'll handle it because it's really dictated by how he looks and, you know, how he's performing. And, you know, there are some indicators we can look at for when he's waning. His start against Atlanta, the seven innings were the most innings that Garrett Crochet has pitched as a starting pitcher. Since March 9, 2018, his freshman season against Cincinnati. In his sophomore year, he got it to the seventh inning multiple times, but he could not just get out of the seventh inning. Or he was pitching in relief for Tennessee, being that weird swing man, lawn reliever strategy that the Tennessee Volunteers used in 2019. So, yeah, this is one of Crochet's longest <laughs> outings, both college and professionally, uh, since his freshman year with Tennessee and he's been fantastic. We're going to be always searching for positive stories, bright lights, and what could be a very dour 2024 season. And Jim, I guess we're blessed early on after five games. It's Garrett Crochet suddenly emerging as maybe a frontline starter for the White Sox. Yeah, it's it's something to think about, like what the season would be like if Crochet met, say, your projection of a starting pitcher to where like he's going three innings and like, uh, you know, getting rocked the second time through, or he's, uh, you know, throwing 92, uh, in the second inning and everybody's worried. So, so far, like, yeah, when you, when you see like, you know, Fetty looked okay. I think for a first start, like he at least showed some swing and miss stuff, but like Soroka, not sure what his final form will be flexing. Not quite sure how he's going to get hitters out on a reliable basis. So like, Really lacking for a uh, another starter, and I'm I have the Charlotte game on the box score on in the background. I just keep seeing Norfolk's score go up. Uh, now it's twenty to eight in the seventh inning. So like Wait, when so it comes what? to what's the score twenty to eight. So oh. Nestrini gave up four runs over three innings. I thought like oh you know that's not good. Padilla gave up four and one and two thirds. Bailey Horn six and two thirds of innings. Aaron McGarity uh, six runs and a one and a third. So. Uh, Nestrini, by comparison, looked better than everybody else. But cranking, cranking a big dial that says Norfolk runs and looking back to the audience for <laughs> <laughs> pretty, pretty much like that was my uh, fear when it came to Nestrini starting the season in Charlotte is like Davis Martin, like when he was there, like the White Sox basically, like, yeah, we trusted your stuff in Birmingham. Come on up when he had like a six ERA in Charlotte because like it's uh, very stupid pitching there sometimes. And I kind of wondered Nestrini, like if he's going to get the same kind of treatment once his turn, but like just based on how dire the pitching situation can turn in Charlotte, like, yeah, uh, whatever crochet is doing now is sorely needed. I think just for everybody's morale, it'd probably be, uh, 
he'd be well advised to keep it up. We are going to take a quick break for a word from our sponsors, but coming up next, we'll discuss the upcoming official signing of Mike Clevenger, the White Sox offense not being like Garrett Crochet. They are struggling greatly to start 2024 and preview the White Sox Royal Series next on the Sox Machine Podcast. This episode of the Sox Machine Podcast is brought to you by Game Time, who is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. I use Game Time all of the time, especially when visiting other Major League Baseball ballparks. Game Time is a cool feature where you could check out the view from the seats you are selecting, so there's no obstruction before finding out the hard way. Plus, with the option to see prices with fees included, I could avoid sticker shock when checking out. Worked great last year when I visited Seattle for the first time, attending Felix Hernandez's jersey retirement ceremony. If you are in the Kansas City area for this upcoming series, Game Time has tickets under $5, and you can grab a ticket behind the White Sox dugout for under $50. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use our code SOXMACHINE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem our code SOXMACHINE for $20 off. Game Time. Last minute tickets. Lowest price. Guaranteed. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match. With Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Congratulations, the by the way, to James Feagan and to Sox Machine. I think that's such a great fit. I don't know if we've said anything about this before, but the Sox Machine's a great podcast for the Sox, and Feagan's always done great work. And I like this idea of, you know, like a local pod having their own reporter and going for it on that level. So uh, kudos to them, and, and, and kudos to them for that match. Yeah, very cool to see James still covering the White Sox for Sox Machine. Thanks for the shout out from Rates and Barrels podcast from the Athletics Eno Saris. Always appreciate that. And if you guys hear us on other podcasts as well, share it with us on social media. Again, you can follow us. We're at Sox Machine. You can follow James at JR Fegan. You can follow me at Sox Machine underscore Josh. We know that this is a very contentious topic for the Chicago White Sox as they dropped it. Shortly after a rain delay, uh, shortly after Austin Riley hit a three-run homer to put the Atlanta Braves up 9 to nothing in Game 4 of the season. But Robert Murray of Fansided was the first to tweet it out that the Chicago White Sox are bringing back Mike Clevenger as Clevenger picked up his buyout, the $4 million, which James referred to an earlier podcast, that that was just really deferred money, a... A little accounting trick for Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams to pass money off the 2023 budget into 2024. But Clevenger's coming back. The guarantee money in this deal is $3 million. There's another $3 million in incentives. We don't know what those incentives are yet. The signing as we record this is still not official as Mike Clevenger has to pass a physical before he signs on the dotted line and he's back into the conversation of making starts for the Chicago White Sox. James, very straightforward question. Why are the White Sox bringing back Mike Clevenger? Uh, they need a starter. I mean, that's hard to deny. Um, I I don't know what Johnny Cueto is up to. Uh, um, they it is expected to. I would expect it to be official on Thursday. Um, you know the the you know Grafol did speak to it a little bit the other day, and once again touted. He said that Clevenger was a positive presence in the clubhouse and obviously performed. 
uh, you know, they, they, they're short on innings in a way where, you know, there's not a lot of trust for Chris Flexen, and I don't think uh, his debut opened it. Uh, Nick Nostrini is a rookie. He's barely pitched above AAA. His first outing, uh, you know, Wednesday night did not go well. Uh, Scott there said he was like 91-94, like the slider looked good and got misses, but otherwise it was kind of a rough look. So um, I don't know if you won. It'd probably be... I think the dream scenario for the White Sox is that like they get a rain out on Cleveland and they can skip the slot again and then maybe some screen can look better. But I think that speaks to the situation a little bit where it's it's definitely a little bit of desperation to get through innings. And I, I think a lot of their strategy is around the idea that they don't want the kind of tanking atmosphere of 2017, 2019, where like things are so bad that like the bullpen's constantly getting put in a bad spot and uh, you're constantly playing uncompetitive games and you're not in a position to really develop anybody because they're not really playing. And, you know, no one's making progress because they're not in positions to succeed. I, I think is how Jim put it pretty well. Um, that said, I don't see why like, getting through the innings in some shape or way, creating that like environment. Uh, I feel like while there's no compelling means out there, I don't feel like this is such a desperate need or that stakes are so high that it's worth taking this kind of um, PR hit uh, that they're willfully taking. And certainly when so much of the language around uh, building fan trust uh, to kind of recreate this association willfully. It was kind of foisted upon them a little bit by circumstance last year to go back in where, you know, as much as I can say he's a good citizen and, um, you know, had no issues and had no discipline under under their stead, um, he was a calculated risk from a character standpoint uh, when they signed him. And his history certainly didn't get like cleaner or less checkered over the past year. I, I don't it's not like there's no risk here and it's just merely like people being in their feelings. Like it's kind of the same calculation they made last year, but with less motivation to do it. Um, and, and probably more knowledge about what, you know, a season with him entails in terms of fan response. So I don't think the juice is worth the squeeze here, um, but they seem to. Clevenger's last start with the White Sox in 2023, he got rocked by the San Diego Padres. He didn't get out of the second inning in the last series of the 2023 season, allowing six runs and seven hits. And I remember that conversation, Jim, we thought, well, that's the end of the Mike Clevenger era with the Chicago White Sox. And man, one day after 11 seasons podcasting with you, Jim, I will be learning my lessons. I will learn to never say never when it comes to the Chicago White Sox. But to the points that James brought up, I'll pose the same question to you. Why is Clevenger going to be joining the White Sox and I guess what is to follow up with James's points like what is really the point in 2024 I, I'll add this context Jim I still don't know what Chris Getz is going after in 2024 but this just seems to be another like one year stopgap solution and a lot of the questions that we have today He's going, Chris Getz is going to force us to kick that can down the road and ask these questions, same questions again at the GM and winter meetings in the offseason. Well, I'm currently watching Danny Mendick pitching the eighth inning uh, for Charlotte. And, <laughs> so there you uh, go. That's why Clevenger's coming back. Yeah. So Peyton Burdick doubled off him to Rafael Ortega, which I think Old is friend. like a, a series of events in like a spring training, like backfield scrimmage. Uh, going on that's the state of the charlotte knights <laughs> uh, against norfolk so like that's kind of it um yeah it, it took me back to the chris getz interview on aj Przinski's show to where he said that we have to earn back trust and we have to show we're all about and like Przinski interrupted him and said like well that's what rick Hahn said and like uh, you know, he said they're going to be different. Here's a move that's, uh, you know, here's something Rick Hahn just said. You're saying it again. How are you different? And like when it comes to signing Clevenger, it's just like that was Rick Hahn's idea. Aged very poorly. It didn't turn out as badly as it could have. Or like by the end of the season, there are so many other things that went wrong that Clevenger by just, you know, judging it by the standards of the White Sox, like he probably was a solid citizen. But here's a case where... When like Pedro Grifol is saying he's he was a positive influence. One, Chris Getz used those words for Omar Vizquel. Uh, that's kind of positive influence. Takes me back to Getz talking about Omar Vizquel. Obviously, that was not the case. Or maybe he was a positive influence on in some players, but bad for the culture overall. 
Uh, the other thing is that like, given how bad the clubhouse was and given how often Griffol misrepresented the quality of the clubhouse until all hell broke loose. And after, you know, basically after his job was guaranteed, then he spoke more openly about how uh, the culture needed to be changed. But like, I don't trust his read or I don't trust the context, which on which Griffol is basing that read of Clevenger. So that's why I think like, it's almost back to, you know, or I guess while Clevenger does have some history with the White Sox, when it comes to just like who's judging him and who's relaying information about like how good or how much he fits into a clubhouse or how you know well he works with teammates, like I don't know if I trust those guys. And that's nothing against Clevenger. It's just like it's just the White Sox are such a poorly run clubhouse or poorly run operation that like even if Clevenger were a standout citizen, like how would we know or who would we trust to provide that assessment. So that's why like, it does feel like they're playing roulette again, basically like they won the first time or like didn't lose the first time. And we're like, yeah, let's, let's go back to that because uh, that's the only game we can win. <laughs> Just like, uh, you know, the, the, the longer it goes on. And it's one thing like when you're making that calculated decision on a character risk and the White Sox didn't know the extent of that character risk until afterwards. But like when you're trying to push from 84 wins to 87 wins and maybe get into the postseason, but when you're talking about 62 wins to 65, it makes it a lot less crucial. I think to me, the only way it maybe makes a positive impact is if the White Sox are saying like, this might be going from 50 wins to 53 or 53 to 58, like something where like we do not, you know, like maybe the Norfolk Tides could run up the score on the White Sox uh, if, uh, you know, things continue the way they are and Garrett Crochet is not pitching. So uh, that's why I think, you know, Getz is going back to the swell. But yeah, just yeah, I've mentioned it before as somebody who hosts White Sox conversations it sucks just because like you have two sides that will never agree because they both hold valid opinions when it comes to uh, the business of Major League Baseball and how guys with spotty track records with character get second chances if they're good enough and if they're not like being horrible humans in real time versus like people who have like real uh you know, deep seated objections for very real reasons to why they don't want to have somebody like Clevenger around. And those sides will never agree. And they're, you know, they're valid to hold the opinions they have. And so like, it just goes around and around and around. And, you know, just over the past few years, I think the White Sox have had enough decisions that just divide the fan base like this, uh, foisted on them to where like, everybody could use a break. We'll hear from Chris get soon when the White Sox make the signing official, and then we'll play the calendar game when Clevenger could possibly join the Chicago White Sox. But for the time being, this is more of a, a four-man rotation as the rain out of the third game between the Braves. That game is now being pushed to June. So that gauntlet of death that the White Sox have in mid-May to late June now is extended a game after three home games against the Dodgers. The originally off day for the White Sox would be that game makeup game against the Atlanta Braves. Um, just a uh, score update from Charlotte. Norfolk is up 25 to eight. Just need a couple of touchdowns. Heston Kerstad grand slam up to 10 RBIs. Justin Anderson running into some trouble. Uh, no, that's all. This is all on Mendix tab. Oh, uh, Mendix. Yeah. Anderson. Just, just Anderson scoreless outing, baby. Uh, kinda. He allowed, uh, let me look up here. I oh, know he did uh, not actually let me see. I think he let a couple inherited runners. Oh, he let all three inherited runners score. Good. Technicalities. Well, I don't think Danny <laughs> Mendick's going to help out in the White Sox bullpen. So again, we'll wait when the news does become official. Mike Clevenger rejoining the Chicago White Sox and helping out in the starting rotation. But I'm still going to make this point. Even with the addition of Mike Clevenger, I don't think it greatly changes the White Sox outlook in 2024 unless Mike Clevenger is a league average bat. Because we need to talk about this White Sox offense. I know it's just five games. That's an incredibly small sample size. But boy, this offense is lacking. To start 2024 as a team, the White Sox are hitting 181 with a 244 on base percentage and they're slugging 329. They've only scored 11 runs in five games. 
If you recall, I made that joke on Twitter. Did the Arizona Diamondbacks on opening day score more runs in the third inning, 14, than the White Sox would score on their homestand? And if you guessed or you picked yes that the Diamondbacks did score more runs, congratulations, you can collect your winnings. And when it comes to runners in scoring position, a very key situational hitting scenario, the White Sox have a, and I'm sorry to scare everyone, a 481 OPS with runners in scoring position. That is easily the worst in Major League Baseball. They are 3 for 25 hitting with runners in scoring position. The good news is that they collected two hits with runners in scoring position. Gavin Sheets and Andrew Vaughn both had bloop singles just outstretching the Braves infield to drive in the go-ahead and winning runs for the White Sox. And Jim... We had a feeling that this offense could be bad, that the White Sox have put it, they, they put a lot of attention and a lot of effort into proving the defense and the pitching. But in their quest and trying to make games go as quickly as possible, I guess congratulations, Chris Getz, you have built an offense to do that, but we might be watching one of the worst offenses in White Sox franchise history, and that is saying a lot in the 120 years of existence of this ball club. Yeah, especially relative to the environments, relative to the name brand talent on the uh, on the roster, like how good some of these players should have been and aren't being right now. But I think it's like just partially a product of like pretty lousy weather, at least spotty weather. And like there's a difference watching like Jose Abreu wearing layers and like a, a – a balaclava and like, you know, just looking miserable out in the field and having a slow start to April and realize like, yeah, he'll, he'll be up to 30 homers and hundred RBIs at the end of the season, probably most of it in August. And like, you can count on that. Like Alexa Ramirez wearing boxing gloves, basically as batting gloves going to the plate because he couldn't handle it. And he ended up where he needed to be, even though he got off to a slow start. And, you know, there's that. But then like when you're watching this offense and it's kind of like living up to or I guess living down to its billing in terms of not drawing walks, not hitting for power, just not doing a whole lot. Then, yeah, you kind of run into the same problem as last year to where the good at bats are mostly singles and just stretches the innings out until it gets to somebody who's going to not deliver or it's going to be a case of just. The inning does get to Yohan Mankata, but it happens to be the one where he doesn't get on base. And he's like one of the guys getting on base at a respectable league average clip. But like when he doesn't deliver in his one or two plate appearances with runners on, like, oh, he's not clutch. And then it just goes round and round it goes again to where, uh, you know, he's the guy starting the rally and then like Dominic Fletcher isn't finishing it or whatnot. So that's kind of where the White Sox are. And I think as long as Eloy is not looking like first half of spring training Eloy, it's going to be probably more of the same in that just you're looking for very long sequences of good at bats in order to have these uh, productive innings because like either the instant offense or the uh, letting pitchers walk themselves into trouble aren't two things the White Sox really do. Paul DeYoun has now out homered Tim Anderson from last year. So the White Sox are going to get more home runs in the shortstop position. So that is a plus offensively, but Paul DeYoun is two for 11 to start the year both hits home runs. He has struck out seven times already uh, this season. That's a very high strikeout rate. So, James, where should White Sox fans place their hope within the White Sox batters to, ho- to carry this offense to, to better results? Like, I don't think they're going to have a sub-600 OPS for the season. I really hope that they don't have a sub-600 OPS for the season. But a lot of the things that Pedro Grafal talked about – During spring training, we want to walk better. We want to have better discipline. We actually want to be swinging at strikes. Five games in, it looks worse than last year. Um, Robert will probably be fine. (laughs) (laughs) Is there an easy way out of this question that I can take? Yohan Makata. Yohan Makata has been like... Yohan Makata has been good. Yohan Makata has been good in that way where... um, you know, he's good, but there's also like the, you know, at, at bat where he just kind of swings through changeups every now and then. Like he, he manages to like put up numbers and this is good for him. Like when he's on these roles, it's good uh, in these roles. I mean, like he doesn't look super locked in, but he's just like being quietly productive and finding, um, you know, ways on base, even without, you know, just a 
a really hot streak of uh you know loud contact um there, there's at least signs like Sheets has taken pitches, but he's kind of always taken pitches and, and gotten walks. And, you know, the, the swing decisions has strangely never been the issue for a guy who is a power prospect. You'd think Vaughn has to be better. I don't like as frustrating and like not quite fulfilling as, as he's been in terms of his offensive ceiling. He's never been like this bad for like for a long period of time other than like when his body's giving out on him. So I think, you know, there, there's some rebound. I don't think Dominic Fletcher as much as like, yes, this is part of the risks that he wasn't going to hit uh, was his profile. If he was, if it was more of a sure thing to do bash righties, he wouldn't have been available in the way he was, but you know, he's, he's just done, you know, kind of nothing <laughs> for so far. I mean, it's kind of a good, bad, five bad games, meaningless sample for him. I don't think he's even played that many. Um, I, I think there's, there's a fair amount of people who are like at this just absurdly low. Like we know that they won't bottom out this hard rate. Like we're at the same time, like, I don't think Martin Maldonado will go hitless all season, but like, yeah, I'm not necessarily expecting like a big bounce up that will make the offense look a lot more competent from him, which is kind of why, like just why they're not the team to kind of say like, Oh, we don't care if we get nothing from him the way the Astros were Um, at the same time. It seems like he's someone to kind of swear by to uh, development, how many rookie pitchers that they'll be cycling through uh, more so over the course of the year than they even are right now. Um, they, they should be better, but at the same time, like, yeah, this is, this is why this team is, this is why I don't think they can really do much this year, uh, is because of this thing that we're all seeing. There's not many places to go when like the main guys are not, you know, in hero mode and Louis Robert win the hero mode for a game. And they still lost it. So that, that speaks to their, you know, tenuousness. What was the expected batting average in Dion's home run against the Braves? Like it was below a hundred. It was very wind aided. It was nice to see, uh, you know, a bra- a opposing hitter hit like a a a, a BS win aided home run, and the White Sox like not seed that home field advantage to somebody else. Like, say, a week we can pop, like <laughs> BS flies the morning track too. <laughs> uh, so that was cool. It does it has lead like a goofy nature. Like Dejong's two home runs are, uh, you know, one that bounced off the top of the wall to Apio, and the one the the jet stream one that, you know, it's like. It was simultaneously stat cast out as out in like what eleven parks, maybe eight parks, or one Marcel was eight, he was eleven. But yeah. it sailed over the bullpen because that's how intense the wind was at that point. Um, so yeah, with him and I think Shoemaker was starting for him the other game where he homered. So they they've just blown away previous shortstop power production, but it also hasn't looked like him the two homers that he's hit plus Shoemaker don't make me feel like, yeah, they're gonna they're going to be piping these out all summer. Just, just you wait. Uh, it kind of remains to be seen. Um, that that Braves game was very much like good thing. Baseball is 27 outs and not 28 because if it's 28, I think the Braves <laughs> win six to three. Uh, offensively, Jim, the goal for the white Sox in this upcoming series against Kansas city, someone other than Luis Robert or Yohan Makata hit a double after five games. The team only has three doubles, two from Makata, one from Robert. Yeah, they're averaging like basically like in you know two extra base hits a game, which I think needs improvement. Right. But yeah, if you're not going to walk, which they only have two guys with multiple walks on the season, um, that's Moncada and Sheets with two apiece. <laughs> I'm still waiting for DeYoung to draw his first walk so he can draw, draw yeah, end his uh, walk drought. But yeah, they're just. A lot of ways the performance can improve individually to where like even one guy getting on a little bit of a hot streak will probably turn the fortunes in a positive direction for the whole thing because of just how top heavy the lineup is. But yeah, it's, uh, you know, there are enough credible hitters to where you can see it being possible, but also just like, uh, you know, Nicky Lopez's early returns watching uh, the right field platoon you know, swinging through a lot of stuff right now. Martin Maldonado being there for his leadership, but kind of all his numbers elsewhere are bad the way you think they might be. Like it's uh, the White Sox picked very particular trade-offs when it came to the brand of baseball they're trying to play. And like DeYoung, I think is probably the best example of it. Like they wanted defense and uh, a little bit of power here and there. And sure enough, he's got two homers. He did commit the error, but that turned into an outfield assist. So like they're, they've been playing clean baseball defensively, but it's just, yeah, it's, it's not something where you're going to like flip the channel over to the White Sox and say like, I got to keep watching more of this. 
You might only want to watch Garrett Crochet pitch <laughs> right now if you're an occasional or casual watcher of the Chicago White Sox. When it gets to the bottom half of the inning, especially when it's at the bottom of the order, you can uh, do a chore or something. Fetty looks solid, all right? He's missing bats. He would give the Northbrook blo- Tides a, a, a real rough time right now. <laughs> Can Fetty hit? <laughs> that's gonna be my that's gonna be my thing for yeah. a little bit until this White Sox offense picks it up. But that leads us to the next series. Again, the Chicago White Sox are going on the road for the first time in 2024. Thanks to our patron supporters again. James Vegan will also be traveling out to Kansas City. The Royals are two and four on the season. They blew a three to nothing lead in their final game of their series in Baltimore. As they're up three to nothing going to eighth inning, but the Orioles scored two runs at the bottom of the eighth, and then old friend James McCann walked it off for the Orioles. So the Orioles, they've lost back to back series. They lost their home series against the Minnesota Twins, and they lose a series to the Baltimore Orioles, but they have been playing pretty competitive baseball to start 2024. Your pitching matchups for this series, Thursday night, Mike Soroka will make his second start against Seth Lugo. That's a 6.40 p.m. Central Time start. Friday night, Eric Fetty against Brady Sainer, which Sainer had 10 strikeouts against the Minnesota Twins, shutting them out. Uh, in his last, in his first start of 2024, that's another 6:40 p.m. Central Time start. Saturday night, Chris Flexen against Michael Waka. That's 6:10, and then on Sunday afternoon, Garrett Crochet will make his third start of the year against Alec Marsh. Jim, since we have been podcasting together, covering the 2014 season to now, the White Sox are 40 and 52 at Kauffman Stadium. Why has this been so difficult for the White Sox to win in this damn stadium? Probably because it's a big park and the Royals play defense and the White Sox don't. So like all the marginal ways in which the White Sox kind of uh, stepped on themselves time and time again over the years where even they were decent. Like I think a park like... Uh, Kaufman is the one that kind of exacerbates all of their flaws and all the ways they give up runs, all the ways they don't hold runners uh, when the Royals ran. Like just, uh, I think that's partially why. And then like, as uh, you know, Griffel talked about in his uh, job interview, his introduction, I should say, and I guess he talked about his job interview as well, saying like, yeah, the White Sox didn't play with a whole lot of energy when he saw him. And so I think it's just uh, the, you know, kind of getting dragged down to the Royals level and the Royals beating them with experience. I think that's kind of applies here to where the White Sox just didn't get up for them. And the Royals were happy to, uh, to stop on them while they were basically on the same level. So yeah, I, I basically it. So I guess that will put the Chris Getz construction to the test in terms of like cleaner defense, a little bit faster, a little bit more athletic covering more ground, especially in the outfield. So let's see how that actually holds up because this should be like, yeah, the White Sox have a very Royals heavy flavor to them, and it maybe this is where it all clicks and looks like it's worth something. James, what are going to be the storylines you are looking to follow up on or cover this weekend in Kansas City? Um, I talked to Soroka today. Uh, you know, he's he definitely feels like he overcooked a sinker a lot in his debut, and uh, you know, feels like he got the action of it. Uh, a little bit back towards the end of his outing. Um, they 4,000% thought he was tipping in the first inning of his outing where he got bum rushed. So that doesn't, you know, all of a sudden miss bats that he didn't miss during his start, but it, it takes away maybe a little bit of like the concern of the immediate barrage of like extremely loud contact that he faced um, that he's just, but uh, he's not going to get the Soroka sinker back. Cause he's just not throwing the same, like, he was talking about like he used to throw super high out of like a release point with like uh, the worst extension of the game, which becomes so weird and unique that becomes an attribute where it's like, it's just not coming out the same as other pitches where now he's a lot more of a just traditional three quarters righty. But with that, he feels like his four seam is better. He feels like he can command his secondaries a bit more where, you know, like obviously he had the weird sinker out of his own profile, but he didn't feel like everything else is maybe as reliable. So he, he seems pretty at peace with the idea that he's going to throw a ton more sliders and change ups than you saw out of, uh, you know, any 2019 Soroka. And he kind of felt like, you know, describing it. And I don't think he would have maybe put it in harsh terms, but he kind of put it as like, 
yeah, I feel like I was getting away on being kind of gimmicky and weird and new in my first half of 2019. And this evolution was already kind of being forced out of me at the second half. And I, I felt like, you know, he he thought that like that the great playoff start he had at the end of that year was really a lot more slider and change up heavy than people associate with them. So hopefully that's kind of a plan that we'll see coalesce a bit more without the kind of, uh, you know, I feel like he kind of got rattled in that first inning. It was hard to really execute a game plan when you're trying to adjust your delivery and everything. So maybe it'll be a smoother path for him. That's definitely worth watching since he's kind of the one of the projects in the starting rotation that you want to see. It, it'd be lovely if, uh, you know, Chris Flexen was uh, more functional um, in, or showed us a bit more against maybe a less high-powered offense. It's, it's certainly not... Uh, starts against the Braves that you even in a rosy view of Chris Flexen are expecting him to thrive in. Uh, and it, it seemed like his first turn to the order he had him off balance, at least a little decently. Uh, maybe when he's not facing like, you know, MVPs, all stars, and home run kings, he can get through two turns of the order and, and provide you a serviceable um outing. I, I certainly think that they seem like they're figuring out their bullpen hierarchy a little bit in the sense of like. Griffol is willing to die with Chris, with Kopech out there. Uh, if need be, he feels like that's his highest leverage arm. So seeing that a bit more, uh, you know, he'll definitely be rested enough where you can see him being used uh, in high leverage if it comes up again. Uh, that, that's kind of worth watching that there's a bit more consistency. He wasn't necessarily that great, but again, the high level of competition uh, puts it to where you're like, he survived. And that seems like something Mary, uh, that merits watching, especially when he's touching 100, 101 while he's doing it. Um but yeah, it'd really be nice to just see like the offense function in, in, in some way. Uh, I feel like we haven't got a ton of that. It seems, and, and certainly Grafol is, you know, especially for justifying keeping him active and not Ielema. Now they've sent Lenin Sosa back to Charlotte. You know, if Eloy Menes, uh, if, if this is a reason to keep him off the IL, he should play this weekend. And what kind of Eloy Menes are we going to get? Which is kind of a storyline for, you know, every day when we wake up, but certainly <laughs> relevant towards surviving this team and its offense. Jim, how about you? What are you going to be paying attention to this weekend? Well, I'm going to be in Birmingham. So that's where I'm oh, going to be. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So thanks to our Patreon supporters for supporting both of our travels. Um, I'm, I'm glad I'm not heading to Charlotte, where the score is now 26 to 11. Danny Mendick settled down for a one-run inning, gave up a solo shot to Peyton Burdick, but otherwise limited the damage. Brett Phillips just struck he, out. He was, he was also overcooking his sinker yep. early on. Now he's... Yeah, he was, he was throwing it at 53, and now it's down to 51. Um, Brett Phillips struck out five times, so platinum sabre there. But uh, <laughs> this game's got everything. Yeah, it's really just a lot going on. JJ Cooper tweeted that uh, Charlotte had the worst uh, record in AAA the last three years. Uh, with negative uh, 133, negative 224, and negative 291 run differentials from 21-21 to 2023. And now they're going to be one in four with a 22, uh, negative 22 run differential. But now I'm going to be down in Birmingham uh, watching their season uh, kick off. Don't have the rosters yet, but Edgar Caro is going to be there, Brian Ramos. Um, rotation looks like probably Eater is going to be leading the way, or at least, gonna, um, you know, it looks like Drew Thorpe's going to be there, uh, Iriarte. So look at some new guys in, in, in the White Sox system. So lots to look at pretty much every pitcher I think is probably worth watching to one level of interest or another. And, uh, should be a, a, a pleasant change of scenery. I think for, uh, <laughs> for a lot of people when it comes to just, uh, you know, Guys with, you know, hitters with upside, uh, a lineup that might produce. And even if they're producing, it's like, give them time. They might. Is Nicky, uh, Nicky Delmonico, the hitting coach still for Birmingham? Yes. Who's managing? The Sergio Santos. Oh yeah. So I'm looking forward to, uh, talking with him and seeing just like, what was it like getting traded after signing a contract extension <laughs> and never throwing a pitch for that team? <laughs> yeah memories well that'll be fun well you have fun in birmingham jim as always grab some banana pudding best banana pudding in the world is in birmingham alabama and jim will have all the coverage about the barons and those interviews and stories about the white Sox double affiliate on socksmachine.com and james will have everything covered for the white Sox, also in socksmachine.com out of Kansas City. One last thing, and this is something just to keep at the back of everyone's mind because May 24th is coming up, which is the end of the legislative period for the state of Illinois. It could be extended to May 31st. 
We are owed one more last desperate run by related Midwest, the Chicago White Sox and the Chicago Bears and trying to get state funding for new stadiums. And very timely, the city of Kansas City, Jim, voted against a sales tax extension and pretty one sided. It was 58 to 42 percent in favor of no of not extending that sales tax by another 40 years, I would have helped finance a new downtown stadium for the Kansas City Royals and remodeling of Arrowhead at their current location. And I, I tweeted this out, and now this is how I feel about it. I think this is even more evidence for politicians in the state of Illinois, even residents of Chicago and Illinois, who do not want to give Jerry Reinsdorf another stadium. That Jerry Reinsdorf and Related Midwest might want to pick up the phone and start calling some banks. Because if Kansas City will not just hand over financing to the Super Bowl champion Kansas City Chiefs, then I just don't know how the White Sox and Bears are going to drum up enough public support to get state funding for new stadiums. Like, I was worried that the White Sox would be moving to the South Loop sooner than later, but after what we saw in Kansas City and the vibes we're getting from Chicago, maybe I shouldn't be that concerned. There is an element of like, if one city can do it or like one electorate can do it, like everybody can. And like politicians can feel emboldened to, um, you know, not give handouts to professional sports teams and uh, thinking they'll have enough of their peers also doing the same to where, you know, other cities and markets won't be used as leverage. But I guess like after this vote failed, uh, some legislators in Kansas across the state line are saying like, Hey chiefs, uh, we got some land for you. We don't right. mind. Um, yeah, I think Kansas is among the most aggressive States in uh, either tax incentives or handouts to corporations, et cetera. Um, there's a, you know, kind of a rivalry between Kansas and Missouri on state line road, going back and forth, like businesses jumping back and forth based on which States giving the better deal. And I think, they're testing to see like how attached the chiefs are to Arrowhead. But yeah, it, it was just so sloppily done. I think the way the site took a while to settle on, like they were talking about like uh, things like some site yeah, might be called East bank or that might be Nashville actually, but it's like East river, like location, new entertainment district. They were going on that for a while. And then all of a sudden crossroads downtown, Kansas city printing press. We're doing that. How many people are we going to displace businesses, churches, et cetera? Not sure yet. And it came about <laughs> very late and they didn't really have great messaging to counteract the community uh, groups protesting against it. So I think like the protests were a lot more cohesive than what the Royals were pitching. And then like the chiefs were just kind of afterthought at the end, like, Hey, we're on a roll. Maybe we can get some free money. Uh, Cause people like us so much and maybe attaching themselves to the Royals plan. Wasn't the way to do that, but they also need the Royals to move in order to kind of gain right. control of the entire uh, uh, stadium site. So there are a lot of like moving pieces here to where I think the White Sox have a chance of being a lot more cohesive from the start with the way they pitched this one site and are just like, they're not really flirting with anything else. They have renderings already. So they're already ahead of the Royals there. I think it's really a matter of like how much the bears want to cooperate with the White Sox or like whether it's either both of them getting something or nothing at all or whether the Bears because they are the favored franchise would get something and the White Sox wouldn't because they really haven't done anything to deserve it like there are a lot of elements in Chicago that I think don't quite apply to Kansas City starting with the discipline of the uh, project uh, the builders just settling on one site and having a pretty straightforward message so far saying like this is how it's going to be. Here are some renderings. Here are all the different ways you can get to the park. Uh, the, the the big question is like, who's going to pay for the rest of it? Aside from like infrastructure money and, uh, you know, building new um, L stations, et cetera. And like, they're like, yeah, don't worry about that yet. And I think that's the big, uh, big question uh, nobody wants to talk about. But everything else I think is a lot more disciplined than what the Royals presented over the course of like a lot longer time. Just don't put it up to a vote. That would be my recommendation yeah. for the White Sox and Bears. If this gets put up to a vote, eh, no, I don't like your chances. Start calling banks. You might okay, have I thought, to oh, yeah, I thought you were talking about from the city, like you're hoping as like a, a taxpayer to not put it to a vote. 
You're, you're saying for oh, the White Sox no, side. Okay, no, gotcha. The White Sox and yeah. Bears, that they don't want this to go yeah. to a vote. We, we just had a recent election, and City Hall had their homeless property tax plan shot down. Yeah, I just don't I just don't see it happening in Chicago. So if Kansas City yeah. says no to the defending Super Bowl champions, I can't see Chicago and Illinois saying yes to the White Sox. And it was a similar proposal as well. We're just extending a tax that already exists uh, versus right. like a new one that, you know, actively or more you know, easier to feel the uh, the punishment of a, a new tax. And even then, that didn't fly. It did not. It did not. But we'll see in how the White Sox do against the Royals and look forward to how the Birmingham Barons start this season. So James and Jim travel safely, guys. And yeah, James, best of luck in Kansas City. Hopefully the White Sox play some entertaining baseball. And I hope the stories are good out of Birmingham, Jim, over the weekend. That will do it for this episode of the Sox Machine Podcast. We will reconvene on Sunday night to record a new episode to, de- to deliver to you guys on Monday morning to recap what happened in Kansas City and also in Birmingham and touch on what else happened around Major League Baseball. So you can look forward to that. And, of course, we are back with Bernstein and Holmes and 670 to score. James was with them on Tuesday, and then we'll be back with them on Friday as well. As long as the Cubs are not playing an afternoon game, again, you can check us out on Bernstein and Holmes and 670 to score. They are on weekdays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Either listen on 670 a.m. if you're local, if you are not local, on odyssey.com or on the Odyssey app. I will be Mondays at 125 weekly. All right. Excellent. They give you a dedicated time. Did we get a dedicated time, Jim? Haven't heard. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> we're, we're on standby. But we don't uh, get bumps. Fridays. James gets bumped all the time. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you can subscribe to the Sox Machine Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, such as Spotify and Apple Music. Uh, again, Google Podcasts no longer exists, so if you have been listening to this podcast on Google Podcasts, you can now listen to it on YouTube Music. And speaking of YouTube, you can watch our videos and listen to the podcast on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Socks Machine. Follow us on social media. We're on all the platforms at Socks Machine. You can follow James at JR Fegan, and you can follow me at Socks Machine underscore Josh. If you enjoy our work and you want full access of all of our coverage of the Chicago White Sox, subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash Sox Machine, where monthly plans start at just $5, and we also have other additional tiers of support. So if you enjoy your work and you want more, there are opportunities to get more, such as monthly Zoom calls with us. We still have a couple of spots open to the Veterans Committee, which opens you up to a little bit more behind the scenes of what we do at Sox Machine and also the group chat as well, in which James always dishes out juicy information that he's hearing in the press box and at White Sox games. So if you're interested in that, you can reach out to Jim and I through patreon.com slash Sox Machine. I'm a huge gossip. <laughs> Yeah, James He's is a gossiper. He messy. He loves drama. <laughs> Those are big selling points if you want to be in the Veterans Committee uh, for Socks Machine. Again, go to patreon.com slash Socks Machine uh, to reach out to Jim and I about those opening spots. Socks Machine Podcast is a production of SocksMachine.com. You're on for all things Chicago White Sox baseball and part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. Alongside Jim Margulis and James Fegan, I'm Josh Nelson. Thanks for listening and watching. Whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, we all understand the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance. That's why I'm excited that Unified Healing is sponsoring this podcast. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by Energy Enhancement System, or EE System. If you haven't heard of the EE System, you'll want to listen up. This technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, purification, and rejuvenation. At hundreds of locations across the globe, access to a center is easy and affordable. Interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself? Go to unifiedhealing.com slash bluewire to learn more and find a center near you. 
That's unifydhealing.com slash blue wire. No material or testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including EE system.